Body Logic Physiotherapy, empowering people to achieve better health. When you talk about persisting symptoms, I try and explain that it's got much more to do with other factors, not mm. the actual pathology that you might yeah. see on an image. Yeah. It's much more to do with psychosocial factors. Yeah. Uh, and, and that often turns on a light bulb, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, when when you talk about what 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 predicts what are risk factors and, and what what might reduce your risk and you talk yeah. about yeah. things like smoking and obesity and catastrophization and mm. fear and beliefs mm. um, that that then starts a conversation about oh well maybe yeah. if I think about those things yeah. and less about the pathology that exactly. might be way through many people with low back pain get the wrong care, causing harm to millions across the world and wasting valuable healthcare resources. That was a direct quote from a research paper published this month, August 2020, in the journal Pain. The article was led by the voice you just heard, which belonged to Professor Rochelle Bookbinder. Welcome to episode 13 of the Empowered Beyond Pain podcast. Proudly brought to you by Body Logic Physiotherapy. So, who is Professor Rochelle Bookbinder? Well, for those who aren't familiar with who she is and what she does, allow me to enlighten you because she truly is a remarkable voice in the musculoskeletal pain space. Professor Rochelle Bookbinder is a rheumatologist and clinical epidemiologist who also holds a professorship and NHMRC Senior Principal Research Fellowship at Monash University in Melbourne. She's recognised as one of the world's top experts on low back pain, led, that's right, led the highly publicised and highly regarded low back pain series in the prestigious medical journal The Lancet in 2018, and is tenacious in the promotion of good high value care for people with pain. She recently also added Officer of the Order of Australia to her long list of accomplishments. So in short, she's kind of a big deal. That quote I recited at the start of this episode about many people getting the wrong care for back pain, causing harm to millions and wasting incredible amounts of healthcare resources, was from an update paper to that Lancet low back pain series. The update highlights that low back pain is still the number one cause of disability in the world. It still costs a lot of money. For example, the US spent an estimated $134.5 billion, with a B, US dollars on back pain in just the year of 2016. It highlights that many people are still receiving the wrong care which causes harm. One of the most disastrous examples of harmful medical care being prescription opioids, which was a problem in most high income countries, and now, thanks to aggressive marketing in low and middle income countries, is also becoming a problem there. By the way, we now have even more evidence that an opioid strategy is not more successful than a non-opioid strategy for persistent low back pain or moderate to severe pain from hip and knee osteoarthritis, thanks to the SPACE trial, as well as more evidence that opioids are more likely to cause adverse events. While opioid prescribing does appear to be falling in some high-income countries, worryingly, it seems they are being substituted with gabapentoids, for example, gabapentin and pregabalin which the evidence does not support as helpful for those with back pain or sciatica. The vested interest when it comes to pharmaceutical drugs is something Rochelle discusses in this episode, and it's highlighted by the fact that the World Health Organization recently revoked two guidelines relating to opioid use, conceding they had been influenced by the pharmaceutical industry. That fact drop you just heard was summarizing the update paper that Rochelle led. We are so grateful for all that she has done for people with pain and for the time she gave us to share her incredible knowledge. We're also super grateful that you're here with us, listening to the wisdom that she shares. As you will hear, the incredible power of social sharing and knowledge is what helped the state of Victoria change back pain beliefs and behaviour for the better in the late 1990s through a huge mass media campaign. Sadly, the funding for this campaign was cut when the government changed, which is a huge shame. A lot of the fact drop highlights the negatives, but what should we do instead? Well, that's what we're aiming to empower you with by doing this podcast. A big part of our mission is to make contemporary pain knowledge go viral and better inform the public, people with pain and the people treating those with pain. And of course, to help empower you beyond pain. 
So please share this conversation generously with your networks. Tag us at EBP Podcast on the socials and be part of the change that you want to see. This was an absolutely fascinating and insightful chat and I found myself in frequent awe at the quality of conversation between the two profs. Like a kid listening in on a conversation between two superheroes. I was a happy bystander as Pete beautifully articulated questions and thoughts I found myself having. If you enjoy the conversation half as much as I did, you're definitely onto a winner. We'll start by hearing fact three of the Back Pain Facts paper presented by popular patient voice Pete Moore. Then we'll get straight into the conversation with Rochelle. Show notes with resources discussed in today's episode, as well as all the others, are available at www.bodylogic.physio forward slash podcast. And as you heard last week, we're moving to fortnightly releases, which will give you more time to digest the conversations and more time to ask, is there more to pain than damage? Persistent back pain is rarely associated with any serious tissue damage. Backs are strong. If you have had an injury, tissue healing occurs within three months. So if pain persists past this time, it usually means there are other contributing factors. A lot of back pain begins with no injury or with simple everyday movement. These occasions may have contributions from stress, tension, fatigue, inactivity or unaccustomed activity, which can make the back sensitive to movement and loading. Uh, welcome, everyone. We're very lucky to have Rochelle Bookbinder to join us on this podcast. Um, first of all, I think, Rochelle, could you please just introduce yourself? Hi. Um, so many thanks for having me. I'm a rheumatologist and a clinical epidemiologist, and I work in, um, in private practice uh, at, at Cabrini Hospital uh, and also at Monash University. Okay, and you hold a professorship and you're also an NHMRC um, Senior Research Fellow, is that correct? Senior Principal Reach yeah. Research Fellow. Yeah, yeah. Uh, significant positions. Can you tell us about those positions? Uh, so I have a research fellowship from NHMRC um, for um, uh, work relating actually to um, developing uh, the Australian New Zealand Musculoskeletal Clinical Trials Network and trying to improve the translation of evidence into practice. Mm. Uh, and that will continue next year with an investigative grant um, along the same lines as well as trying to reduce over diagnosis and over treatment. Fantastic. Great. So, one of the things that I was um, particularly interested in, Rochelle, is as a as a rheumatologist um you've developed quite an interest in back pain and that's not that common and i'm interested in how that came about so i i did a masters of clinical epidemiology in toronto canada and when i came back i had a part-time appointment in the department of epidemiology and preventive medicine uh, where i still work and the Work Cover Authority were planning to set up a, a mass media campaign for back pain. Uh, and this was because for the previous 10 years, their costs for back pain had doubled uh, over, a, no, had tripled over a decade. And they tried to change clinician behaviour and nothing seemed to work. And at the time, the back book had come out in the UK and, they, and Australia has a... Um, a really good history of mass media campaigns for things like um, seat belts and um, skin cancers, so the slip, slap, slop, slap program. So they decided they were going to mount this public health campaign. And they actually asked some people in our department who worked with WorkCover whether they wanted to if, uh, be involved and evaluate it. And they actually declined because they didn't think it would lead anywhere. Uh, mm -hmm. And then someone just said, oh, would you like to do it? And, and I sort of went, me? <laughs> well, I guess I'm not doing anything else. And I wasn't, you know, I'd just come back. So I said, okay, I'll give it a go. And, and so that's really how it started. And I didn't expect that it would be successful. So I was pretty naive about what they wanted to do. Um, but 
I decided that if they were going to do it, then they should do it properly and it should be evaluated properly. So, so my role was really to develop the evaluation uh, and, um, you know, to sort of push that they would evaluate patient beliefs as well as doctor beliefs and we'd look at real outcomes. Yeah. And, and that's how it started. So this idea of, um, of targeting beliefs, can you tell us about how that evolved? Yes, so because obviously you've got a problem where the costs are going up for a problem tripled, and you're then uh, targeting community beliefs. How does that work? How did that work? So basically, uh, the Work Cover Authority looked at the back book and pulled out the main messages there, and they were very clever, very simple, clear messages that if you had back pain, you didn't need to worry. Most people didn't need to stop doing what they were doing. Most people didn't need to see a healthcare practitioner they could stay at work. Um, and, and that's really how the main messages came about. And, and what, the camp, what the Work Cover Authority did was to actually to put every, all the stakeholders, all the clinical stakeholders in the room to come up with what the messages were and get everybody to agree on these simple messages. And they also included employers and, and, and tried to get everybody on side um, to think about the legislation, to think about um, how everything could be um, towards the right, the right goals. Uh, and so that, that's how it really started. And, and then they employed a really, a new pub, um, advertising camp, um, advertising company to come up with the slogans and the people involved in the messages were involved in the ads. Uh, so that's how it all evolved. But my role was really about evaluating it. Uh, and originally, they just wanted to do some focus groups, which they did do, but we, I wanted to evaluate it quantitatively. Yeah. And as I said at the beginning, I was really sceptical about it. And, and so when yeah. we saw the first results, we were going, no, this can't be right, although it just yeah. seemed too good to be true. But then when, when we did, when I sort of then looked in, into public health campaigns, I realised that it was always going to be successful. Like it, it, it just was going to work. And there were so many benefits of priming the whole population that yeah. not everyone needs to see the ads. Everyone will just move better as a result of the ad campaign if, as long as enough people have seen it. Um, so that really started me on a journey about the importance of perceptions and, and having the right attitudes and beliefs and how that was so important in the society, in the background cultural um, yeah. environment to drive um, the changes. And then you could add to that more targeted campaigns for high-risk groups as well. But, yeah. but the whole thing was this mass media moving the societal attitudes and beliefs over towards better beliefs. Yeah. So for people who are not familiar with your, that study, can you just describe exactly what it was? what the media campaign did and how it worked? So the mass media campaign, it was, it was carried out between 1997 to the end of 1999. Uh, it was funded by the Victorian Work Cover Authority and it was planned that there'd be subsequent top-up ads uh, every other year, but the government changed at the end of 1999, so there have been no ads since then. The campaign was 90%, it was television commercials and they were aired during uh, um, really TV programs that the whole community would watch. So grand final football, cricket. Uh, and at that point there was no Foxtel or uh, any of those other streaming services. We basically just had the four or five channels. Uh, and so the campaign were these television ads, they were, they were very much uh, um, shown in these high impact um, shows. Uh, and then there'd be a period of less ads and then there'd be um, another more um, intense campaign. 
And it was accompanied by uh, billboards. Uh, every doctor in the state of Victoria got a, a booklet about the management of compensable back pain, which we think was just thrown in the bin. No one really looked at that. Uh, and the back book was translated into many languages and that was given out by caseworkers um, to people who had compensation claims. Yeah, right. uh, so that was the, the primary part of the campaign. And the evaluation, uh, what we did was we did telephone surveys of the general population before the ads started, during the campaign, and then at, after the end of the campaign. And uh, we compared, we used what's called a quasi-experimental uh, design where Victoria was compared with New South Wales and we excluded people who lived on the border who would see Victorian television, for example. Uh, and that was accompanied as well by mailed, mailed surveys to GPs in Victoria and New South Wales, again, excluding postcodes on the border. And we also did those surveys before the campaign started, during and after. Uh, and then after the end of the campaign, we were lucky enough to get a couple of additional grants and so we could do follow-up even after the end of the campaign. And then the third part of the evaluation was to look at what actually had happened to the work cover claims for back pain mm. compared to non-back pain claims and to try and compare what was happening in Victoria to New South Wales and also to South Australia. Mm. So we could look at, in Victoria, we could look at the number of claims to see whether the number had gone down, the duration and the costs, basically. And what did you find? <laughs> and so we found uh, dramatic improvements in uh, the general population beliefs in Victoria compared to New South Wales, where there was no shift in beliefs. So and what kind of beliefs did you find shifted? So the, the main beliefs that shifted were the main um, aims of the campaign. So the population in Victoria were much more likely to think that um, you didn't need, you could continue usual activity, you didn't need to rest for back pain, you didn't need imaging, you could stay at work, um, you could self-manage. Um, and, and so, and the primary um, measure that we used was something called the Back Beliefs Questionnaire. And so the Back Beliefs Questionnaire improved on average by about two points compared to no change in New South Wales. And then by the end of the campaign, it had actually increased by about three points, which at a public health, a public population level, that's a huge improvement over yeah. the whole population. We also showed that the belief shifted irrespective of your age, your gender, your work, your socioeconomic status, whether you'd actually had back pain or not, and whether you'd actually seen the ads or not. So it actually moved mm -hmm. the whole population over, uh, starting with the average and the better beliefs. And by the end of the campaign, the people that with the worst beliefs also moved. Mm -hmm. So it was a really dramatic um, example mm -hmm. of how mass media campaigns can shift population beliefs. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of GP beliefs, we also showed similar things. So GPs in New South Wales, there, were, there was really not much shift in their beliefs over the three years. But in Victoria, G, Victorian GPs were much more likely to say you, you didn't need to rest in bed, you could stay at work, you didn't need imaging. Uh, compared to their um, GPs in New South Wales. Uh, and similarly, irrespective of, of many uh, variables, everybody improved in terms of general practitioners. But the only group of GPs in Victoria who didn't shift as a result of the campaign were doctors who self-reported that they had a special interest in back pain. Yeah. So we asked them whether they had special interest in occupational health, back pain, musculoskeletal. And once you allowed for everything else, if they had a special interest in back pain, they were actually much more likely um, to think that imaging was necessary, that yeah. you did need to stay away from work. Um, they were also more likely to think that you didn't need guidelines yeah. and, um, th and that education would not be helpful to them. So they are a really yeah. intransigent group and yeah, right. don't understand who they are, but the bottom line it really is if you've got back pain to all the patients listening, don't <laughs> see it initially as a special interest in back pain. That's they confusing. That's work. very confusing for the public, though, isn't it? It's very confusing, yeah. but it, 
but I guess you you could you could think about why that might be, uh, and you know we don't know for sure, but but we think it's probably because they some of these clinicians might have vested interests that that push yeah. non evidence based care. Yeah, yeah. That's very interesting. And I think you had other outcomes that um, were linked to people actually changing their behaviours as well. Is that right? So it wasn't yes. just beliefs that changed. So we also were able to, we, we didn't think that the, the campaign would reduce the number of claims. We were hoping that it would reduce the duration that they spent off work. But we actually found that uh, the number of people who put in claims over that period declined significantly as well, uh, and as well as the duration, uh, mm. as well as a, 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 a quite a large reduction in the total costs and the medical costs. Yeah, right. So that was really the, the way we could measure behaviour. Unfortunately, yeah. we had a very fixed budget. We would have obviously liked yeah. to do lots of other things. Yeah. Um, and I was particularly interested in children because yeah, my yeah. kids were young at the time and and they were walking around with that slogan. And when I lie down for a headache, they go, oh, mum, you know, should you take back pain lying down? So <laughs> I just wonder whether that would That's be so really interesting. interesting to study now. Yeah, Yeah, right. Do you think those, um, uh, those changes have sustained in Victoria? So we, we were able to do follow-up studies at about, uh, I think it was about two years after the campaign and then about four and a half to five years after the campaign. And we demonstrated that both um, GP beliefs and population beliefs, there had there uh, was a sustained um, improvement with some decay. Mm. Um, and again, in New South Wales, there was absolutely no change. Yeah, uh, right. And so we think that if the if the government hadn't changed and we were going to spend some money every second year topping up those ads, that probably would have we would have been able to maintain that. Yeah, right. So it kind of fascinates me that you've got a problem like back pain, which is a like leading cause of disability in the world. It costs a government's extraordinary amount of money. Why they wouldn't invest in something like that? What, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, I really don't know. I mean, the, the Victorian Work Cover Authority, when the government changed, all the people with the corporate memory left uh, right. work cover and they went actually went to the wheat board. Um, right. The reason the, the first follow-up survey we did was funded by the Work Cover Authority because they came and asked me about doing another media campaign and they really didn't seem to have any... Uh, remember the understanding that they actually funded the first one right. yeah. uh, and then the person that was in charge of public affairs left again and so then they weren't interested in doing it again uh, and then subsequently another couple of times they've contacted me again but there's, there's just no corporate memory about yeah. the value of it and yeah. having said that in Australia there are campaigns that have that mm -hmm. replicated what we did in Australia mm -hmm. and for example in Alberta Canada yeah. they continue <clears throat> to have the um, campaign which is much more low-key it's mainly radio commercials yeah but they obviously see the value in it yeah right so interesting now <clears throat> if we kind of zero back into your role as a clinician because um, you would see people who come in to see you with back pain, I presume. Yep. Um, and I'm interested in the common beliefs that you would see typically in those people you see. Yes, yeah, so I guess being a rheumatologist, I get people uh, who were referred for back pain. So often they've, they've already seen a number of other people in primary care uh, and sometimes I might see them more acutely. Uh, so they often come with with a whole range of mis, misconceptions about back pain. Um, and, and I'm sure that, Peter, I know you've seen them too, that mm. they have beliefs that they can't move, that, yeah. that you know, that and then they're looking for someone to fix things. Yeah. Uh, they want some magic me medicine. Are you sure there's nothing else I can try? And, yeah. and, and so it's really, it's really hard to, to, shift those beliefs and, and so I have to spend time explaining what I know about back pain uh, mm. uh, and, and sometimes I'm not sure that they believe me but but often they've come because I'm the end of the road uh, yeah and, but it's a 
it's so hard to talk to them then compared to if I had them when they first got back pain yeah. and what I do yeah. with my friends. You know, my friend in the next street said, I can't get out of bed and I just go around. They go, well, you have to. And I just drag him, <laughs> him around the block. And the next day he was much better. So, I mean, that's what I really want to do. Yeah. Um, it's so interesting because, I mean, what you're tapping here into is that you're seeing people at the end stage of often of their journey when they've seen lots of healthcare practitioners and what does that tell us about the healthcare workforce and the way they care for back pain? Well, it, it's just amazing to me that that people, that the clinicians have have almost identical, I mean, it shouldn't surprise me, but they have the same misconceptions about back pain as, as the patients. And, and that's part of the problem is that clinicians think that they need imaging to find the cause of back pain so that the yeah. treatment can be directed to that cause. Yeah. And they don't still understand that most, in most cases that's not possible. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, a lot of work over the last 30 years trying to reduce imaging from back pain, and we're now in, in a mess where the number of CT scans cost over $100 million a year in Australia. So. Yeah. We're actually, even though x-rays have gone down, this more complex imaging has gone up yeah. and that finds more sensitive things. Yeah. And then the report um, makes people very worried because yeah. it, it mentions all these labels that then they think they're going to be in a wheelchair. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so th we're just fighting a losing battle and yeah. in lots of vested interests again, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. trying to justify their, their specific treatment. Yeah, yeah. So that idea of um, I'm in pain, there's got to be something on a scan that can make sense of the pain. And then we've got sensitive imaging that shows lots of stuff that then gets dumped as a label on somebody. How do we hope to break that process? Because it's endemic, as you say, and it's creating a lot of distress and leading to disability and over-treatment. Yeah, I, th I think it's a really difficult problem and I've spent a long time trying to change clinician behaviour and deciding that it's a waste of time and we have to change public behaviour. Yeah, right. Mm. Um, but I'm even wondering now whether we whether we let people have imaging and we change the report. And yeah. so we're working on trying to to simplify the report, knowing that more and more people see the report and in some exactly. countries they get they get their report you know texted to them immediately yeah. often before yeah. the clinician yeah um, but but that will take a lifetime of or maybe a generational change among uh, radiologists who think yeah. they have to report all the findings in a certain way yeah uh, and the guidelines all say that and and so as until we can try and change that report to say this norm back is normal for age or there is nothing here that is likely to be the specific cause of this person's pain. Yeah. I think we're going to be in trouble and we have to stop uh, reports saying suggest injection here yeah. or yeah. suggest further tests. Cause I think that the, the, the GPs and probably the physios think that they have to follow that advice because these are specialist radiologists. Yeah. Uh, and, and I hadn't realised their influence on things. So how do you deal with a patient who comes to you and they've got a, like a typical CT scan and it shows disc degeneration, facet joint arthrosis, disc bulges, annular tears, all this scary language on a scan. How do you go about trying to help people understand that that's not something they should be worried about when they've Googled on the internet and seen lots of scary stuff and talked to their friends and been told by other healthcare practitioners. It almost seems like you're sitting on the other side, you know, on another planet talking a different language. So I, th I think, I mean, without dismissing their worries, I try to explain that these are typical findings in people who don't have symptoms in their age group. And mm. I quote studies that have shown, you know, that by the time you're 50, you know, 50% of us will have these changes and, and they'll often be present in 25 year olds. Uh, and it, and it doesn't necessarily mean that that's the cause of their symptoms. So that's yeah. how I start. Yeah. Um, 
and then you know, you know go from there and, and again it depends on how much insight or how much they're prepared to open open up in terms of their miss you know mm. how much they're willing to listen to me yeah uh, exactly and you know sometimes if i get them early i just try and dismiss oh well that's just normal we don't even need to yeah. go there um, yeah. but but then that might be a bit dismissive so i try not yeah. to I try not to be dismissive, but but at the same time, let them know that this is normal and and unlikely to be related to your symptoms. Yeah. Or we can't tell you it might be, but but I can't tell you for sure. And 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 the treatment is it should be more general anyway in the first instance. Yeah, and you know I think within medicine, I mean I'm not a medical, I'm not medically trained. I live with someone who is, but um, the, this whole idea of a diagnosis is kind of central to a lot of medical thinking. What kind of diagnostic label do you put on back pain where it isn't sitting within a clear pathological process? There is no clear pathological process. What do you think, what are the labels that you think are helpful for, for clinicians to use and to patients themselves? I'm interested in your thoughts. So there've been a few studies trying to work out what the which terms might be the most acceptable, mm. uh, and and really it's got to be something that's that that explains it without being scary. Yeah. Uh, and, and the value of having a label is that patients feel more satisfied. Exactly. Uh, yeah. But you know, I I try and explain that back pain. Often people that have back pain will have episodes ongoing. So you've just got another episode of back pain. Non, not not worrisome back pain. Um, I try not to use specific. You know, I say I might say non-specific, but I have to always qualify that by what that means. Yeah. So I'm not even sure that not non-specific is helpful. It's just yeah. another episode of back pain. It, it's probably unrelated to what you did. You know, and then I try and explain how it's really hard to physically hurt your back. Mm. Um, but I don't know that there's any easy answer. I think. I've also thought that there's a lot of a lot of the way that medicines is evolved is surgery, yeah. and a lot of the rationale for surgery is on fixing a problem. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. and you know we've seen with arthroscopy of the knee and mm. and decompression of the shoulder that it, that what makes sense um, yeah. to sell something is actually may not even be true. So yeah. and and so back pain like shoulder pain and knee pain they're just symptoms then they're, they're yeah. not they're not cancer they're not yeah. they're not sort of medical diagnoses and yeah. maybe we should just say that you've you've just got some a symptom which is back pain and and yeah. not even have a diagnosis yeah and, and do you think that's a bit like people accepting they have a headache but they haven't got brain tumor <laughs> Uh, it's you know some headaches don't have a diagnostic label like back pain doesn't. Do you think it's similar yeah, to that? Yeah, I, I mean, I often, I often because I I do get migraines and and mm. when I was a medical student, I thought I did have a brain tumor. <laughs> yeah, so I did have a scan and and a neurologist that I still see says, and how's your brain tumor going? <laughs> so, so I can understand that worry, yeah. and people yeah. get really worried, and especially yeah. if the pain's not getting better, they're worried. So I think that's a good analogy, and and even for people with widespread pain, I always, I actually use the analogy that when I'm stressed, I get a migraine, and yeah. when you're stressed, you might get back pain or generalised mm. pain, and mm. so I think that's not a bad analogy, but again, you don't want to dismiss it because exactly. often you know, people do get severe episodes of yeah. back pain. Yeah. Um, but if they try, if you can explain the trajectory that it will come and go, mm. I think that's more reassuring. Yeah. Yeah. It's a tough space, isn't it? Because you've got an expectation that's placed on a healthcare practitioner to give a label. And often, you know, there are different labels. So within the medical world, it's more around structure and imaging and the physio world, it's more around, uh, you know, something with the body that's kind of identified as maybe something wrong. Uh, And there's very little evidence that those things are predictive of much. Yes. So we're kind of left with a little bit of a vacuum that is not satisfying for the clinician or the, the patient. Well, I think, I mean, the only way you can explain it is 
is when you talk about persisting symptoms, I try and explain that it's got much more to do with other factors, not mm. the actual pathology that you might yeah. see on an image. Yeah. It's much more to do with psychosocial factors. Yeah. Uh, and, and that often turns on a light glow, light bulb, I yeah. think. Yeah. Um, when, when you talk about what, what, what predicts, um, yeah. what are risk factors and, and what, what might reduce your risk. And you talk yeah. about yeah. things like smoking and obesity and, catastrophization and mm. fear and beliefs mm. um that that then starts a conversation about oh well maybe yeah. if i think about those things yeah and less about the pathology that exactly. might be a way through yeah and I, I think what you're touching on there is something you can change that potentially is modifiable yeah. that means you're not under a knife as well <laughs> and it's yeah. going to have an impact on your pain it can help you and, and a lot of time, I mean, we think a lot of pain is is genetic and it's learned and, yeah. you know, it's what your brain's remembering. Yeah, so exactly. once we start putting that all into the mix, then yeah. people start to, if you know, if they have the capacity to think about it more deeply, yeah. um, they can then, we can then help them much more, I think. Exactly. And how, how, I mean, if you think about a public health campaign, that sounds like something that would be really important to educate the public about around what the meaning of pain is, do you think? Well, I think, I mean, I think the beauty of the campaign and, and the reason we, like we didn't expect the number of claims to be reduced is that the campaign reached people before they had a problem. Yeah. And, and because they, they'd seen the ads perhaps, I mean, this is all speculation, they yeah. go, oh, oh, well, I've got back pain, but I know from that ad campaign that it'll probably get better and I don't need yeah. to do anything about it. Yeah. So that's why we think it reduced the number of claims yeah. to begin with. So, yeah. so that's priming the people before they have a problem. Yeah. And it's the same with everything, you know, it's the same yeah. with slip, sock, slap, you know, you're yeah. priming people to know what to do before yeah. they get a problem. Yeah. Yeah, and then the key then is if they have a problem that persists, then instead of frightening them with further imaging, making sure they don't have something serious, of course, is important. But then instead of frightening them with further imaging, is give them a broader understanding of the risk factors and yeah. then strategies to manage them so that they can self-care. Yes, and, I mean, we didn't talk about it before, but, I, th I mean, the primary thing that pushes clinicians to do tests is is the worry that there is something serious. And exactly, that's... Yeah. That's a legitimate concern. Yeah. yeah. But, but, you know, nothing needs to be decided today. There are not many yeah. things that we need to find the answer to. We can afford to wait for many, many people with that pain. Yeah. And so even just thinking about delaying, you know, further tests just to see, yeah. I think is reasonable as well. And, and that would be something else that we should encourage, like the antibiotics yeah, you, know, you don't need antibiotics, but if you're not getting better, we need to reassess it. Yeah. So that sort of idea is yeah. to go across too. Yeah, got it. Now, I, I'm I'm kind of interested in, you know, as a rheumatologist, you would look at a lot of scans and obviously screen pe people's bloods and things. What are the things that, you you know, that are important? So if you we have listeners here who might be going for a scan, what are the things that you see on a scan? There's lots of stuff reported. And there are lots of things that you know are, are you know common in people without pain. What are the things that you would say that is important? Okay, so there there are very few things that are really important. So I would say cancer is important. Yeah, of course. So when you find primary or set or metastatic disease, that's obviously really important, and that's something that you know you get a good good sense uh, of the likelihood of that from taking a good history. So they, if they've got a history of cancer, um, infection is something mm. that you don't want to miss. And and so uh, people that have got really severe pain and they've got a fever or they're drug users, mm. I think that's something that you don't want to miss. Mm. Um, vertebral fractures, um, again, that's something that, that mm. you need to know about, uh, but they, they're common in older people. Mm. Um, and, a, and and conversation for another day is, a you know, what is a real vertebral fracture? Yeah. Um, and we've done lots of work in that space, haven't you? Yeah. And, you know, I think they have to have symptoms. Yeah. Um, and then there's the sorts of diseases that I do treat, which is yeah. the axial spondyloarthritis um, group, which really are 
um, patients that have marked stiffness in the morning that improves with activity rather than gets worse with activity. Um, young people, um, males or females, um, and, and that's a diagnosis um, that's often delayed because it's missed uh, and, and we have effective treatments for now. So that's mm. something important to think about. And then I guess the, the only other big group is the people that have true pressure on nerves and pain going down the legs. But, yeah. again, most people can be treated the same as if you didn't have um, what we call radiculopathy mm. symptoms. Um, yeah. But if things are not getting better, um, then you want to see that there's a confirmation of pressure on the nerve. Yeah, so right. Yeah, the main and, and then and, there'll and, be a whole lot of other things. Yeah. So if you look at the, you know, take 100 people with back pain, how many fit into those specific groups? In primary care? Yeah. Less than one. Yeah. Less so that means 99% of people coming in and getting a scan and getting told there's something, arthritis, degeneration, all those things yeah. are being mislabeled. Mis well, again, is it a mislabel or right. is it a over label. Um, yeah, I got it. Yeah, okay. But, I mean, that's something that we struggle with because the the, the changes might be there yeah. on an image, but that doesn't make the diagnosis. And I think we have to separate yeah. those things. Yeah. Yeah, and that's the that's the meaning of language, right? And mm -hmm. and and the role of a healthcare practitioner to help the patient make sense of what that means for them. Yes, and that's and a conversation. A conversation that that says that. These changes are common and often present in people without symptoms. Mm. Uh, they don't mean that your that your pain will not go away. They don't mean mm. uh, that your outcome, your outlook is terrible, um, and they mm. don't mean that you need any specific treatment. Mm. And that sounds like if, if that was on a radiology report, that sounds like a really easy intervention. It does, and there have been a couple of studies now with conflicting results about the value of putting what we call epidemiologic data about how common it is in asymptomatic people in your your age and your sex. Um, but I think that would be relatively easy. Mm. Uh, and even, even if the reports, we've done some work looking at reports, even if the report had a conclusion that said, despite all these changes that I've described above, um, none are specifically likely to have caused your, the patient's pain or mm. something like that that's very reassuring yeah. I think would be important. Yeah, yeah. but your, your confidence of something like that becoming normal is not great from what you're saying. Well, I mean, I don't know. We're working with some radiologists both at our hospital and in Seattle, Washington, yeah. um, on trying to improve um, the way imaging is reported, uh, and I, th you know, I think that changes will happen. Um, but yeah. we've done a review of the guidelines for imaging reporting, and and there's a lot in there about what machine you use, the technical stuff, um, and much less about the comprehensibility to the um, person that or, that requested the image, and nothing at all about the importance of the language for for patients who might be reading the report. Yeah, and, right. and some radiologists still think that the report is written for the referring uh, doctor. And, yeah, right. and the referring doc some referring doctors still think that, but the majority of patients think that the report is should be written in a language suitable yeah. for them. Yeah, mm. so interesting. Yeah. I, I had a, um, a, a scan of my brain a couple of, oh, a year ago um, for a another health complaint um and it came back that my um my my scan of my brain was normal what well, the changes were normal for my age so there is a precedence in uh, radiology to report those things yes. and i'm interested why they would say that for my brain which was which is reassuring although i was hoping it would be younger for my age but <laughs> <laughs> but but it seems like it's not like it's not without precedence in radio radiology. No, and and we I mean we've been looking at reports and and some radiologists do say this is normal or yeah. this is likely to be of no clinical significance. Got it. Yeah. It's just it's not very consistent. Yeah. And and I think there are differences depending on your vested interest in the in yeah. the report. Yeah. Um, yeah. So we know there's a study done in the US that sh that found that 
the the biggest risk factor for getting an X-ray in the US is if the referrer owns the machine. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, those vested that, interests that, are really powerful. Yeah. I think so. I just want to touch on one other thing that I'm really interested in your thoughts on. You were part of the Lancet series on back pain. I think it was a couple of years ago now, uh, and it hit the news. It was it, like it was big in Australia, and a lot of the messaging was that we're over-treating people um, with often risky, um, not particularly effective treatments and under-treating them with um, safe. We're not do it using safer and probably more effective treatments. And, um, there was quite a lot of backfire um, on some of that messaging in the public, I think. And I'm interested, um, like, well, we, we heard a lot of people going, you know, what do you mean? You know, like that, that's quite a conflict to say that actually we're spending heaps of money on stuff that may be not very helpful. As a, as a, and there's a public demand for that kind of care how do we try and shift that? I mean, that's, that's kind of like bigger than the imaging story. Sure. I, that's interesting that you say that. So, yes, we did um, do the series and there were 15 million people that saw a uh, Twitter handle of low back pain, which was yeah. the Twitter uh, handle we used for the series. We are not aware of negative um, reports. We've actually done a review of the media oh, that's interesting. the time and found that 90% plus were accurately reporting our messages. And we were really yeah, right. clear on media releases, what the main messages were. Yeah, right. The only, the only misrepresentation of the um, Lancet series were people with vested interests who yeah. particularly actually chiropractic organisations and physiotherapy that used the Lancet series to say that... Uh, that people should go to the chiropractor or the physio, that we can fix right. this. So yeah, okay. there was a lot of, there was some of that misrepresentation yeah, okay. of the series. Yeah. Um, yeah. We we actually, people were silent. The people with vested interests that we really yeah, okay. pushed in the series were silent from our perspective. That's interesting. Um, and we we did we did highlight that there that a lot of the care is iatrogenic it's harmful yeah and that we're not really funding or or doing the right care and there's a lot of right care that we could do and could be adequately yeah. funded so we pushed for changing the system changing the the pathways that patients have the education of clinicians and and the public changing policy so that yeah. we can reward the right care and we stop funding the mm. wrong care. Do you think and any of that's changing? I think that there are lots of conversations around the world now about some of the yeah. messages. Um, we've been really pushing um, in different countries to, to change things. Uh, and there are things in Australia like the MBS review that, that tried to reduce spinal um, surgery mm. uh, and and then the uh, the AMA um, got some negative feedback and the government um, reversed their decision. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think the again the problem is these major stakeholders that are powerful trying to uh, trying to stop uh, the progress in terms of addressing the burden of back pain. Mm. Uh, yeah. I mean, it's not just back pain, it's other conditions yeah. as well. Exactly. And so we have a, that, that's why, I, you know, some part of me thinks, oh, I may as well just give up. It's just too <laughs> disheartening. And Don't you dare. Like, there are companies <laughs> who are pushing yeah. opioids and yeah. Lyrica yeah. and now in developing countries, yeah. um, you know, we, it, they have millions of dollars pushing yeah. bad care. And yeah. we know, I mean, one of the things that came out of the series the way we sold it to the Lancet was we wanted to s try and prevent the same things happening in developing countries. And the yeah. disappointing thing is it's mm, yeah. it's already happening. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So we don't want to end in a really depressing note. So <laughs> I do share your sentiment though. It does feel like you're pushing a big, a up. big boulder up a hill yeah. <laughs> and, and there's not many people pushing it. Um, uh, what do you where do you see the opportunities to kind of positively impact this area for the future? Because public campaign seems like it's still something that you really have seen great evidence for to kind of 
get the public to drive demands yeah. something different i think we ha- i think we need to harness the consumer voice and mm. and they're getting much more powerful around yeah. the world uh, they're you know they're part of an action must see research grants i think we have to stop wasting research dollars on on rubbish yeah. and, and try and really push uh, evidence informed practice much yeah. more yeah. Um, so i think that there are some positive things that we can push i think it's important that we get into positions where we can influence policy makers yeah. uh, we're still trying to influence the who uh, yeah. I think we can harness um, media to uh, work for good and not evil and try and, again, get the positive stories out. So, for example, in Crokey, we have a, a regular series called uh, Wise, um, uh, um, Too Much Medicine. Um, yeah. Sorry, I'm just struggling to remember the name. And, we've, we've, you know, we've, we've got a national collaboration for Wiser Healthcare and we have a national statement. Mm-hmm. So the more people that can join this i i really think we need a movement mm. to, uh, yeah. because mm. we know i mean even with covid we can see that yeah. there's been a lot less medical care um, yeah. and it remains to be seen how much harm there's been but i'm sure that some of it's been positive in, in yeah. unnecessary imaging for example yeah. has gone by the wayside yeah so awesome. i think it's just a matter of getting all the right all the people in the room and yeah. and just having the will and the enthusiasm and yeah. the drive and the money yeah. To, yeah. to change. Yeah, awesome. And do it together as a social group, right? We, we can all work together with this. Um, was there anything else you wanted to add? Yeah, no, I think I, we've I, done a fan, think, fantastic I, job of um, of discussing the, the landscape around low back pain. Um, and we've particularly um, nicely covered our, our third fact from the paper, which was um, that persistent back pain is rarely associated with serious tissue damage. And you've given some fantastic examples of that. Um, before we go, Rochelle, is there anything else that you'd like to add um, in the in the podcast for the listeners? Uh, no, thank you. Um, hopefully, hopefully I've I've made clarified yeah. some issues that people may have had yeah. rather than yeah, made abs- it worse. <laughs> Absolutely, and I, I think one of the things I'd like to just highlight is to thank you for the extra. I mean, you probably do the work of four or five people, I would imagine. Um, but um, thank you for the extraordinary work that you have done for. I think the health professions and also for the public uh, and that you've kind of got off slightly, you know, in an area that wouldn't be traditional for rheumatologists, but you bring this kind of ability to bring your knowledge and energy and, and, and drive it in all these directions. So I, a big thank you to you for the work you do thank from you. everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Awesome. And Peter, thank you. Wow. The end of another episode. I've got to say, I reckon this one could be a game changer. I hope it resonated with you too. My take-homes? Social sharing and mass media campaigns can be pivotal at moving the needle in a positive direction. Vested and conflicts of interest are rife in the back pain industry, presenting a big barrier for high-value care. Back pain due to serious tissue damage is incredibly rare, less than 1% in primary care. But this doesn't mean people can't have serious pain. For the overwhelming majority, you don't need imaging. It is safe to stay at work and safe to keep moving, even if you have serious pain, which we know can be influenced by lots of different physical, emotional and lifestyle factors. So let's not take low back pain lying down. We need to keep this momentum going, so please share this across your networks. Check out the show notes at www.bodylogic.physio forward slash podcast. Tag us at EBP podcast on the socials. And remember to ask... Is there more to pain than damage? Please note, what you heard on this episode of Empowered Beyond Pain is strictly for information purposes only and does not substitute individualised care from a trusted and licensed health professional. If you would like individualised high-value care for your pain, sports or pelvic health problem, head to the BodyLogic website and make an appointment. Theme music generously provided by Fervin and Cash.